kids were scared they would get lower grades. If they got lower grades, they wouldn't get as good of jobs. If they wouldn't get as good of jobs, they would be paid less. And if they were paid less, then this would affect interstate commerce. That's the logic that they used. In class, nobody was against the idea of the federal government. Nobody was against the idea of the federal government banning, banning, if you remember, guns on public school grounds. The Supreme Court, did they uphold this? No. They said this was too big of a stretch. The commerce power is the biggest power that the federal government has. And this was one of the few examples, one of the few examples of a limitation on it. Do y'all have any questions about anything else in Chapter 3? Don't worry about the court backing plan. That is going to be removed. So and the budget activity is removed as well. The uh, tax and spend is basically just to know that the, uh, the, the Congress has the power to levy taxes and to spend money. For the powers at the end of the chapter, the best thing to be able to do is know the examples that are associated with them. What was the example of the tax and spend power? The, um, the drinking age. So if you, and we just went over the drinking age today, so this should be fresh, and I don't want to alienate the Tuesday, Thursday folks too much, but make sure that you link with commerce, the different examples, with tax and spend, make sure you link the drinking age, and then privileges and immunities, make sure you link unemployment. Go ahead. Oh, what do you mean by in the beginning? In the beginning, who had the power in the United States? The states or the federal government? The states. The states were more powerful in the beginning. And what is it like today? Federalist. The federal government has far more power today. So when you think back to it, um, in terms of federalism, we've done a complete 180. In the beginning, the states almost acted like countries, and they dictated what went on. Today, the federal government is really all-powerful, and folks say that we need to limit that federal government power. Let me deal with articles here fairly quick-like. And when we get into articles for Chapter 3, do y'all have any questions about these? We have the Oklahoma abortion law, the Trayvon article, the death penalty article, and we had the crackdown in Arizona dealing with immigration. The uh, humane article. What was the humane article? Go ahead. It, it was an article about how to, you know, uh, to kill someone. To kill, to kill someone. No, to kill the prisoner, the, the death criminal. Execute. Thank you, Aramis. What did it mean to have a humane execution? Least objectionable? Well, um, least painful. Yeah. yeah. The idea is, is that if it's too painful, like crucifying somebody, or laying rocks on somebody and impressing them, or drawing and quartering them with horses, the idea is, is that this would be cruel and unusual, and it would violate what amendment? Third? Oh, cruel and unusual. Eighth amendment, oh. cruel and unusual punishment. A humane death penalty means that you let them die as painlessly as possible, preserving their dignity, this kind of a thing. And if you remember, I had given you examples in that article of some world and historical death penalties, and then I had given you three examples of American ones. Do you remember the three American ones? Go ahead. One of them was the, the man in Utah that uh, requested, uh, what was it? Uh, um, Firing Squad was an example of it, yes. What, what, what from the article, what were the three primary ones in U.S., though? Go ahead, anyway. The um, electric chair. The electric chair in Old Sparky. What was the second one? Three shots. Or the injection. The lethal injection was one. And then, of course, what was the one that was in between? Yes. The gas chamber was one. Take a look at that article and maybe make sure that you got a good grasp of American examples of the death penalty. And it runs through some that were humane, and some that weren't, and, and we had discussed this in both classes. With Trayvon, if you remember, you can make an argument that in fact Trayvon, um, what is the stand your ground law? Let's start there. That uh, if you feel threatened, you can, um, you can shoot. If you feel threatened, you can actually shoot the person that's threatening you, and in fact you can kill them, but it is justified, yes. Wait, is it if you feel threatened, or if you feel as though you're if you feel threatened, you have the ability to be able to shoot. But it's, it should be it's supposed to be on, on your property, right? Actually, no. It, 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 if you feel threatened in any capacity, you have the ability to defend yourself or to be able to defend your family. I had mentioned in one of the classes, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in both, if you go to the airports in Florida, they will be giving out pamphlets 
warning you about the stand your ground law and not to get too frisky in traffic or some of these other places because you can legally be shot and killed. With this, make sure that you're familiar with the stand your ground law and I may ask you to interpret the Trayvon case, but there are some facts in there that would suggest that, you know what, maybe Trayvon is, um, was a victim. Maybe Trayvon fit Zimmerman was right to do what he did, at least legally. Maybe not right, but it was legal for what he did. And don't forget the last section of that article that said 92% of the people that are killed, black males that are killed, it's not interracial, but it is black on black murder and violence. And, and the last part of the article says that's really the bigger issue, not the Zimmerman, white, Hispanic, black, threatening figure type circumstance that the media has blown this up into. Um, as far as the other one, the immigration law, is it legal to ask for papers? Yes. It is. When can a police officer ask for papers? In a lawful contact. So can they just come up to you on the street and say, I want your papers? No. No, it's got to be lawful contact, traffic stop, maybe you're witnessing a crime. I mean, any time the police officer is speaking to you in an official capacity, not in a harassing way, is it likely that this is going to be discriminatory? Yes. Why? Because you asked somebody in our class, did you think uh, the, some Mexican, the Latin American guy? I asked if some Mexican, I, I don't remember asking that, Bill Bill. <laughs> Like, would, you uh, would, would you would you think Asian person would be a like a like illegal immigrant or would you think the uh, Mac, uh, like I asked this? Are you I, I sure? You said, you said would you think a white a white blonde would be? Um, I said that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did I say that or did I point at a white girl and say, "Is would you car yes. would you ask her for papers?" <laughs> yes. and, and typically in both classes, the person said no. And then I asked if there was a black person. If it was a black male, would you? No, they wouldn't do that. Well, well what about, uh, I believe it was Max, and I believe it was Alex in Tuesday, Thursday. And, and, and the, the answer was, yeah, yeah I yeah, really yeah. would. And see, the idea is, is that it's racial profiling. Why is Arizona doing this? Because they, because tax. What's the problem? Give me some numbers on this. How many illegal immigrants are allegedly in Arizona? Two million. About 460,000 according to the article, although I've rounded that up to almost 500,000. How much is it costing them? A lot. Hundreds of millions of dollars according to the article. And Arizona is saying, federal government, you failed us. We have got to pass these laws in order to fix the problem that you have failed on. What's the federal government's argument? That we do so. No, that's not what they're saying. They say that you can't do that because the federal government has the but there's